Hello and thank you for joining us today. My name is Kayla Campana. I am an administrative assistant in UCF's history department. Before we get started, please keep in mind that we will be recording tonight's event. We will share with you the link to the recording after the event in a follow-up email. We welcome you to revisit the content for yourself and share it with others. We also invite your comments and questions. If you think of a question for our speakers during the event, please click the Q&A icon in the bottom taskbar and our speakers will attend to your question during the discussion. Thank you. Hello and welcome. On behalf of the College of Arts and Humanities, the History Department, the Judaic Studies Program, and the UCF alumni, we thank you for joining us this evening. We would also like to give a special thank you to the donors that made this project possible, including support from the Jonathan Mednick Documentary Film Fund. As an adjunct professor in the Judaic Studies Program, now in my 15th semester at UCF, I am honored to participate in this presentation of an award-winning documentary by my friend, colleague, and program head, Dr. Kenneth Hansen. Dr. Ken Hansen is an associate professor at the University of Central Florida, where he is coordinator of the Judaic Studies Program and is the Abe and Tess Weiss Endowed Professor of Judaic Studies. As a young student of the ancient Near East, he lived in Israel on Jerusalem's Mount Zion and studied Hebrew in a program for immigrants to the modern Jewish state. He earned a master's degree in international intercultural communication and subsequently worked for a television news gathering operation in Southern Lebanon. Living in the politically volatile region of Northern Galilee, he daily commuted over a hostile border where, in addition to his broadcasting duties, he served as the company liaison with the Israeli army. He went on to earn a doctorate in Hebrew language and literature from the University of Texas at Austin. His multiple books and appearances on syndicated radio, Coast to Coast AM with George Nouri, and national television, including the History Channel and the Travel Channel, have brought his unique insights to a wide audience. This evening's presentation is titled, The Druze, an Ethnic Minority in the Holy Land. Many of you may never have heard of the Druze population in Israel, and I understand that was part of Dr. Hansen's motivation for creating this documentary, which he produced together with a UCF graduate student and a UCF undergrad who researched this in Israel with him. The result of their work has won awards at several film festivals. In 2008, I met Druze citizens in Israel as a tourist in one of their villages and in a visit to Druze soldiers of the Israel Defense Forces at an observation post on Israel's northern border with Lebanon. The Druze people whom I met were loyal citizens of Israel and at the same time proud members of a religious and ethnic group which traces its origins to its own exodus from Egypt about 1,000 years ago. Their story is an interesting parallel to Jewish history, for just as Jews were a religious and ethnic minority in foreign lands for almost 2,000 years, the Druze are a religious and ethnic minority in Israel today. In this documentary, Dr. Hansen and the people with whom he spoke confront some of the tensions and challenges the Druze experience as a religious and ethnic minority. Let me turn the program over now to Dr. Hansen. I'll rejoin you for a discussion and invite your questions after you've watched this wonderful 30 minute documentary. Thank you so much, Rabbi Olshansky, for that very warm, kind, and insightful introduction. I so very much appreciate it. Appreciate being here with you this evening and being here with everyone who registered for our program this evening. Very, very pleased. I want to share something about the documentary that I created really with a wonderful team of helpers, uh, aides and so on. What was the genesis for it? What was the kernel that got me going? Uh, it, actually, the idea began percolating in my mind back at the end of 2018 when I was attending the UCF International Breakfast, annual international breakfast sponsored by UCF right in the Pegasus Grand Ballroom. And 
And uh, there I was listening to UCF's international outreach. And one of the presenters I felt the best was uh, Professor Phil Peters from the film school who showcased the documentary that he and his students produced over in India. It took a whole group of students to India and they made a documentary about India. And I was just riveted by all of that. And I thought to myself, well, gee, uh, in, in Judaic studies, I've been producing a lot of videos already. This is how I teach my online classes via video. And I go into the television studio and I create l little history channel episodes for my students every week. Been doing that for years now in front of a green screen with teleprompter and so on. But when I saw what Professor Peters had done over in India, I thought, gee, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be interesting someday if I could go over to Israel and produce something similar uh, about our field in Judaic studies? And it just kind of floated around in my mind. I thought, what kind of documentary could I produce if I ever got to do one? And I remembered that about a decade ago, I was called upon to introduce a very prominent Israeli general, general in the Israel Defense Force, introduced him at UCF in the Pegasus Grand Ballroom. He was uh, touring the United States and came to UCF to talk about his experience, not just as an Israeli general, but as a Druze, a member of the Druze. I introduced him back then and I thought, you know, the, the Druze have a really remarkable story. Wouldn't it be great if, to do a documentary all about the Druze? And I just let it kind of sit in the back of my head because how am I going to get the funding to go over and, and shoot a documentary in Israel? Well, out of nowhere, early in 2019, I was contacted by College of Arts and Humanities saying, you, you, know, you know, Professor Hansen, we, we have a grant that is potentially for your program, a modest little grant. Um, and it's yours if you want it. The only catch is it is earmarked for, get this, documentary production. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, isn't that interesting? And at the same time, I had been doing a course redesign over at the Center for Distributed Learning, because as I mentioned, I teach all my courses online now. And I was redesigning one of my courses. And as a reward for that redesign, I received a grant from the Center for Distributed Learning. And when I put those two grants together, it was still a, really a very modest sum. But I thought to myself, you know, I've got at least some backing. Why don't I see if I can make this happen? So I started working on it, started pulling it together, um, contacted the editor who had been working with me for years. We got a UCF uh, student history student involved in the project. And he volunteered to fund his own way uh, to Israel so he could take part in this and help us out in, in the documentary production. All I needed to do at that point was to find some people over there to interview, especially the general, General Amal Assad. If I could track him down, I, I started working on that problem. How can I track down General Assad? I started contacting various people that I know, organizations that, that might have contact information, came up with nothing, zero. Nobody knew how to contact him. And time was wasting to say the least. And in the end, I said to myself, look, we will just go over there on the fly and see what, who we can find and what we can do. Uh, we, we call it uh, a guerrilla film production. And it, it really was. We, we uh, all hooked up in Tel Aviv. I rented a car and off we went to the Druze village, Daliat al Carmel, uh, up in the, the north of Israel. I, I didn't have a clue who we would even interview, but we got up there, stopped at a local restaurant uh, to have some lunch. And the local restaurant tour happens to be a friend of the mayor of the village of Daliat al Carmel. And he arranged an interview with the, the mayor of the Druze village. This is the, the biggest Druze village in, in uh, Northern Galilee. When we got to the interview, the mayor said, you, you, you know, you're trying to find this Amal Assad. He's a friend of mine. He lives <laughs> just over the hill. And he contacted General Assad for me. Um, and we then arranged a subsequent meeting in Jerusalem. And, and I got an interview with, with the general. 
who at the time was all over Israel news because there was a lot of, of, of uh, political controversy at the time about a certain law that the Israeli parliament, the Knesset had passed uh, called the Chok uh, HaLeom in Hebrew, that's the nationality law. I explain what that is in the documentary, but General Assad was right in the midst of huge controversy. He was all over the Israeli news and leading demonstrations in Tel Aviv. And I got a real scoop talking with him about this law and all, all that it entailed. So um, I, I was very excited to be able to, to go over there and produce a real quality half hour documentary on a shoestring budget just to show what we can do with, with some creativity and some determination and a little bit of chutzpah. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to show this for everyone now. It's a half hour documentary. Um, actually, it's 25 minutes. When you make a documentary, you leave five minutes for commercials. Uh, of, of course, we're going to show it commercial free this evening, <laughs> just for everybody. I, I, I do hope you like it. Stick around because afterward we're going to take uh, we're going to take Q and A. And I really hope that that this is going to breathe some inspiration into a future project that I'm very keen on doing. I'd like to produce another documentary. We'll talk about that uh, after you see this one. I'm going to screen share, and we're going to watch the Druze. Let's get underway. And I want to go full screen here if I can. Here we go. They are not Jews and they are not Muslim. They are known as the Druze. They are an ethnic and religious minority at the very heart of the multiple dilemmas faced by the modern state of Israel as it struggles to be a Jewish nation while at the same time democratic and diverse. They are scattered among many hilltop villages across Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. They reside in towns like this, in Daliat al-Karmel, in northern Galilee, along the Carmel mountain range, as well as the contested territory known as the Golan Heights. Hello everybody, first, my name is Rida. I'm a Druze man. I live in Dalat al uh, the biggest uh, village, a Druze village in Israel. Uh, I am the owner of uh, this restaurant named Humus Najwa. You are invited. My name is Dr. Ron Spiegel. I am an art researcher. I was born in Haifa, Israel, but in the, in the last three years, uh, my, which is called commercial activities, are located in this nice place called Dalyat al Carmel because we were welcomed very nicely by the, those uh, villagers. And that reason, we transferred our gallery from Haifa to Dalyat al Carmel. It was built by the Ottoman, uh, in the Ottoman period, uh, by the uh, the Druze Emir Fakhreddin El Mani. There are about six hundred thousand Druze living in Syria. That's about half of their worldwide population. Another two hundred thousand or so live in Lebanon. 
And about 150,000 Druze live here in northern Israel. That's about 2% of the Israeli population. We settled as the, uh, the, as the uh, security uh, uh, settlements to keep the border of the emir uh, in this area. It's hard to trace their roots ethnically, but they may well be a mixture of Persians, Turks, Kurds, and Crusaders. Some who live in Western Galilee near the old Crusader capital of Akko are a breed apart, being light-skinned, fair-haired with green or blue eyes. But taken together, the Druze represent something at the very center of the modern state of Israel because they are known as the most integrated minority in the country. And right here in Daliat al Carmel is the historic old house of British author, diplomat, and Christian mystic Sir Lawrence Oliphant, whose personal secretary, Naftali Herz Imber, composed Israel's national anthem, Hatikva, right on that balcony. It's also a very important location for the Druze because we have at this house a special memorial room depicting Israel's peace treaties with Egypt and Jordan, along with a special wall bearing the photographs of those Druze soldiers who have fallen in battle. The faith was named after an 11th century preacher known as Muhammad Ad-Darazi from the Persian word Darzi, meaning seamster or tailor. The Druze religion is considered to be a new exposition of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. For example, the creation story in the book of Genesis is thought of as a parable. Adam, rather than the first human being, is thought of as the first person to believe in one God. From then on, a string of prophets have shared the idea of monotheism with the world. One thing that is, remains always about the Druze culture is that there is separation between religious and secular. The Druze religion is secret, but it's secret not only from non-Druze, but also from secular Druze. Only religious people are allowed to read in the holy books. As for the sacred texts of the Druze, including the so-called Book of Wisdom, they are only to be read by the so-called Ukal, or the knowers. The less enlightened ones, known as Juhal, or ignorant ones, are to accept what's handed down by their elders. The Druze is one of the first uh, religions to, to give the woman the same rights as the man. Some Druze women achieve higher rank, and the rights of women are virtually identical to those of the men. Women are in fact considered more spiritually prepared than men, and are preferred when it comes to joining the Ukal. Now, this is, this is my aunt Nawal. You can see uh, she is religious, and I am secular. The Druze have no traditional people, no conservative people, no one trying to be more religious. You're either 100% religious, you follow all the rules, which means I don't drink alcohol, you're not allowed to smoke, you're not allowed to use drugs, no piercing, no tattoos, nothing that harms your body. You always cover your head, wear like, if you're a man or woman, doesn't matter, the same dress, uniform, black or dark blue, a white hair cover, you're not allowed to swear at other people, you don't drive expensive cars, you're not allowed to do anything that's material, mundane, unmodest, or supposed to get away from, not wear jewelry, not wear any makeup, but you have to be religious 100%, only then you're allowed to read in the holy books. I am not allowed to read in the holy books. I am secular. I can do whatever I want. Two things that you always keep and you never do is marrying non druze and converting to other religions. Other than that, you're free. Nowadays, about a quarter of the Druze pray daily and attend weekly religious services. 
Less than 20% say that their identity is largely a religious thing. Yet over 90% say that they are proud of their ethnicity, and over 70% say that their religion is very important to them. They are destined to remain small in number, considering that proselytism has been forbidden since the year 1043, when a founding leader of the sect, al muqtana Bahauddin, announced that the Druze would accept no more new members. You cannot become a Druze. Druze religion is closed. It was open 1,000 years ago, and now only those born to two Druze parents are Druze. The Druze take for themselves to be uh, loyal, or real loyal to the uh, country they live. So all the, uh, in the Druze society, they, every man should go to the army. If he don't, it's a part of his life. If he don't go, he's not a man. We believe in that. The Druze are a valiant people. About 80% have served or currently serve in the Israel Defense Force, though women are exempt. The Druze are the only non-Jewish Israeli citizens who are obligated to serve in the IDF. They are very brave, very brave, best soldiers. Every regime wanted to hire them. During Israel's War of Independence from 1947 to 1949, the Druze had to choose between living as a minority under Muslim rule or in the new Jewish state. They chose Israel. And some even fought alongside the Jewish defense force of the day, the Haganah. There are few ridiculous uh, events when uh, our Druze soldiers, which participated the IDF, okay, might fight his cousin or his related one in the Syrian army or in the Lebanese army. Doesn't matter where, where are, in, in which side of the border they are. So you can fight and it's happened to me that uh, I, I fight with even my relatives from the other side of the border. That decision has become known as a covenant of blood or Brit Damim in Hebrew. They paid the blood in order to be our allies. And that's the reason we are not to betray them. We cannot, we are not allowed. It's something against moral, against humanity. They are our brothers and they will remain our brothers till doomsday, God knows what. Many Druze have made careers in the IDF, with quite a few becoming high-ranking officers. A prime example is General Amal Assad, who enlisted in the IDF in 1973 and immediately found himself fighting the Egyptian army on behalf of Israel during the Yom Kippur War of that year. At the age of 18, I uh, joined the army as uh, any Israeli. Uh, and uh, I, would, I wanted to go to the paratrooper, and uh, I spent for uh, more than uh, 26 years in the army as a soldier, a fighter, and later on as a commander. And I retired uh, as a brigadier general uh, at 1999. He also became head of the civil administration unit of the IDF in charge of civilian relations with the Palestinian Authority. I spent three, three years in that job and uh, we did a very good job. I mean, the army and I even didn't get only uh, even one stone in, in, in my car when I uh, uh, patrolled there because the people wanted to have their respect and their honor and uh, this is what we did. We fought for, with the uh, terrorists, but we gave the people, the rest of the people, the honors.
Not surprisingly, we find a whole assortment of Druze settlements in Israel. This is Majdal Shams, the largest Druze village in the Golan Heights. The 20,000 or so who live here, as well as in three other villages in the Golan Heights, are torn between loyalty to Syria and Israel. Many refer to themselves as Syrian Arabs, while those who are loyal to Israel know that their Syrian kin could be considered traitors, and that they themselves might be subject to dire consequences if the Golan were ever returned to Syria. The people there feel still feeling that they are belong to Syria. They, this, to Syria, they had they have a lot of uh, relatives in Syria, so uh, they hope or they understand or they want or I don't know if they want or not, but they think that one day they will return to Syria, so they can cut the road, you know. Uh, so uh, they say that they, their uh, uh, settlements are occupied. Uh, first of all, I would like to say welcome in the occupied Golan Heights. You know that uh, this area was occupied in 1967. We are almost uh, 51 years under the Israeli occupation. Basically, I grew up inside Israel. I was seven years old when Israel occupied uh, uh, Golan. My family, like any other families in Golan, was split between uh, the occupied Golan and Syria. I have three brothers who remained on the other side that I have never seen them all in my life. Basically, I met one of them in 2009 in Jordan. But I mean, we, we don't have this feeling. I know that he's my brother. But as I said, we grow in different realities. So even the connections is not so strong between me and my brothers on the other side. Geography here is key, given that the town is perched just across from the volatile border with Syria. And whatever unrest plagues Syria during its ongoing civil war is felt all too keenly by those who live in Israeli territory. Of course, most Israelis today disagree that the Golan Heights, which for decades served as a base for Syrian artillery bombardments of Galilean villages, and which were conquered by Israel in a defensive war for its very survival, are occupied. But disagreements flourish in the Middle East, and all voices have a right to be heard. I mean, lots of the Druze in Gunan, they see themselves as Syrian. They will never serve in the Israeli army. For example, the Druze inside Israel, they serve in the Israeli army, while we used to serve in the Syrian army till 1967. Now, Gulan was under the military uh, rules between 1967 and 1981. At that time, Israel annexed Gulan, has declared as Gulan as, as a part of, of Israel, and they tried to enforce people to take Israeli citizenship. Uh, if we like it or not, I mean, people that were, were, were born in, in, in a Syrian land, they are Syrians, we are Syrians under the Israeli occupation, if you want to put us in the category of national be belonging, I mean, uh, this, is the, this is the reality. So people refuse to accept the Israeli citizenship. And now, I mean, the majority of the people do not, we don't have Israeli citizenship. We are seen by the Israelis as permanent residents of Israel, but not citizens. But we have Israeli ID, which means that we have all the rights, the civil rights inside Israel. Just last weekend, two rockets were fired from Syria toward the Golan Heights. One fell short, landing in Syria proper, but the other landed on the Israeli side of the border. If we are, if we are looking for the best place to live, maybe all the Jews should go to the north of uh, Norway and live there. I was an officer in the army. My nephew in the army, in the intelligence services. My two sons were in the, in the army. Uh, I feel as an Israeli, but the Israeli policy is really bad policy. This is the Knesset, Israel's parliament and government center, where of course 
laws are enacted. It's important to point out that Israel is extremely proud of the relations it has cultivated with its minorities, and especially the Druze, this blood covenant. Yet, in 2018, the Knesset enacted the so-called nationality law, which proclaimed very clearly that Israel is a Jewish state. Okay, but what about other minorities? The gave us a very big uh, how do you say that in our face yes in our face because we didn't believe that any government in israel will uh, exist this slow uh, especially against us because they said in this law that the state of israel is belong belongs to the jews not belong to the citizens in Israel, but to the Jews. It means that uh, if you are, if you live in the United States and you are a Jew, so this country belongs to you more than it belongs to me. And it's impossible for us. I was shocked after knowing about this stupid, idiotic law, because it's written in our Megillat HaAtzma'ut, that everybody, the Declaration of Independence, it's right, it's written there clearly that everybody has the right and every citizen has the equality to the others and no one can interfere with this. Oh, really? It's uh, bad. And uh, uh, especially for me and all, all the other people that gave, uh, give what, uh, the most that they have. The, uh, from my body, and I injured very bad. Uh, my, my two uh, sons also uh, was in the army and uh, take uh, part of uh, defense of Israel. It's really like uh, in a knife stick in our back. I used to say that the Druze are the Jews of the Arabs. Uh, it's a very small uh, community, uh, persecuted, in threat always. Uh, they broke out of the Islam. So they were really in a, in a very delicate and sensitive situation. Uh, they keep loyalty to the, uh, uh, to the flag of the country. It does not mean that they are assimilated. I stood here in the center of this Dalit al Carmel, in the center of the village, with a lot, a big sign protesting this idiotic uh, law because this idiotic law makes them citizens, uh, which is called uh, great, second grade citizens, second class. And they are not second class. They are equal to us. And even, even in many matters, they are, better, uh, they are better than us. Their loyalty to the country cannot be denied. The blood they shared for us cannot be denied. Nothing can be denied. There is a very bad atmosphere in the country in these years, in the last years, which means more fanatic, more aggressive, more nationalistic, more religious. And me as a liberal, you know, I used to say that we are a small minority in the Arab majority which is a small minority in the Israeli majority, which is a small uh, 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 majority in the, uh, a small minority in the Middle East. It's like the Babushka style. I feel so small. If you feel as I feel in the street, the, the, the people in the street, the, this law, Make them, makes them uh, understand that this country, this state, belongs to the Jews, only for the Jews. So if I am here, I am a visitor here. I can be a good visitor, bad visitor, depends who, uh, who am I and who is the, the Jew uh, talking to me. Uh, can be, because I was born here. My father, my dad, grandfather, this is mine, this is mine as well as it's yours. We want to, want to smell equality. We want to feel equality. We want to smell democracy. So the minute we, we lose it, for me, I lose my soul.
I will not uh, uh, give up until they will change this law and uh, make our feeling Israelis as it was. I think this country, this state must be for all citizens. Doesn't matter if, it, if you are a Jew, you are Druze, Bedouin, Muslim, or Christian. If you are a citizen here, it, you are equal, and this country belongs to you as well. In the final analysis, Israel today is left to struggle with itself. Perhaps the nationality law should be overturned, though there was even a Druze government minister who supported it. That's the nature of democracy in modern Israel, where divergence of opinion isn't just tolerated, it's celebrated. Can the Druze be an example of how ethnic minorities can be truly integrated in the Jewish state? As the father of modern Zionism, Theodore Herzl famously said, if you will it, it is not a dream, if you will it. As the credits roll. All right, we are back live. We are back live and uh, I assume you can hear me, right? Yes, yes, yes sure. Yes. Okay, okay. I'm live. Um, uh, and, and I just wanted to share, I wanted to share briefly that uh, after we produce it. Of course, uh, we shot it in 2019. Um, we got to work editing, which is an enormous undertaking. Then the pandemic hit and really pretty much shut down our efforts uh, in um, most of 2020 till actually it was the middle of 2020 until we finally got it, the whole thing done and edited. Uh, it took obviously longer than I'd hoped, but things happened. Uh, when it was finished, I said to my editor, you know, I'm, I'm going to use it, of course, uh, in the online courses that I teach. We, we teach everything Jewish, including the modern state of Israel. And I have already integrated this uh, into the online courses that I teach. Uh, but beyond that, I asked my editor, what, what else do you think we could do to try to get some, some uh, PR for UCF? And my editor, who is a UCF uh, grad himself, he graduated in, uh, from the film school here um, in, um, on a graduate level. He said, well, uh, how about, um, how about submitting this to film festivals? And I said, oh, oh yeah, do you know any film festivals we could submit to? And he came up with uh, several of them. And I thought, well, uh, okay, we'll give, it a, we'll give it a shot. And I started uh, then submitting, making submissions last fall. And by golly, we won at three <laughs> film festivals. Uh, we, we came in first in New York at the Oneros Film Festival. We took first place in Calcutta, India, the Calcutta Cult Film Festival. Never in my life did I imagine that I would be a cult film producer, but here I am. And, and then we, uh, we landed as a finalist in uh, Florence, Italy. Uh, so <laughs> we had some, some real um, unexpected, I might say, success in submitting this and so pleased in how, in how the whole thing worked out. And as I say, uh, I want to, to look at this as a seedbed for producing more in the future. And I have one that is percolating as we speak. 
Dr. Hansen, thank you so much for your for your efforts and for sharing this with us. Uh, not only the uh, the documentary itself, but uh, but how it came about. I think it's an inspiration to uh, to people who have uh, a dream and uh, don't know where they're going to get the resources to uh, to achieve that dream. And uh, and you've uh, you've demonstrated uh, as you quoted um, uh, Herzl. Uh, at the end of the program, if you will it, it is not a dream. Um, so we um, we have some questions now from the audience. I also have some questions prepared, but let's start with the audience questions first. Um, uh, Sam McCutcheon asks, uh, did BB approve the uh, nationality law, or as I heard it, because I was in Israel at the time also, uh, the nation state law, it was called. Um, uh, Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people, according to that law. And uh, Melinda Kramer asks if it is still in effect. So um, would you like to take first shot at those and then I'll have some comments as well. Uh, yes and yes. Uh, it, it is called in Hebrew, Hok HaLeom. Hok is law in Leom. Uh, I would translate as nationality. Uh, or although nation state works in terms of an uh, English understanding. Uh, but uh, yeah, this was a Likud promoted law. Uh, by the way, this, this is a Yom HaShoah, um, an International Holocaust Memorial Day. And I, I bring that up because after the extermination of 6 million Jews that we're well aware of, what state do the Jewish people have? There's only one tiny little land in all of this earth about the size of the state of New Jersey that is a Jewish state. Nowhere else, just the state of Israel. And so uh, Bibi Netanyahu, his whole Likud party said, it's time to make this official. We are a Jewish state. We're not claiming any other state, but Israel is a Jewish state. Uh, of course, uh, that sparked the controversy that you heard expressed. What about others who are not Jews who live in the state of Israel? Uh, and I should also add that even in the Israeli right wing, those allied with Bibi, such as Naftali Bennett, who now has his own political party, but he's considered a, a right winger, but he was critical of the way the law was actually phrased. Uh, he's very strong Zionist. Yes, he believes that Israel is the Jewish state, the only Jewish state, but we could have worded it differently. Uh, so all kinds of discussion and um, uh, debate, huge demonstrations in the heart of Tel Aviv led by General Amal Assad. And, and I was watching these sitting here in the States uh, live on my iPad as I do every, every afternoon watching Israel news live from Israel. And there he was with a, a rally of, of, of tens of thousands of people opposing this law. Uh, but, but again, this is part of the health of Israeli democracy. There is this kind of dispute and debate, and it's, it's good. I'll, I'll add um, from, the, uh, from the textbook that we have used for uh, teaching Jewish history at UCF, um, one of the textbooks by a distinguished British Protestant historian named Paul Johnson. Uh, he says at the end of the chapter about the Holocaust, before the beginning of the section about the modern state of Israel, that the Holocaust taught the Jews that their own country was necessary, whatever the cost to themselves or anyone else. Um, now, as I, as I said, I was uh, in Israel um, around the same time uh, that you are referring to here, um, the July of, uh, of 2018, and uh, over breakfast in my uh, hotels, I read uh, much of the debate about what the English language press called the nation state law. And it seemed to me that it was uh, created to serve uh, both internal and external ideological agendas. Uh, and, uh, and from my perspective, and I'm gonna throw it back to you with, a, with another question. From, from my perspective, um, the, uh, the Likud, the Israeli right headed by Netanyahu, uh, Bibi Netanyahu and their political allies um, had 
uh, had a desire to make a statement to, uh, to try to uh, cement their uh, parliamentary majority, which has been very much in flux and is in flux to this day, right at this moment. Yep. Uh, Trying to it, form a government, right. In addition, it seemed to me that this was a response to uh, people uh, in the US and, uh, and Europe uh, who are advocating for a one-state solution, not a, not a two-state solution with a Jewish state and a Palestinian state side by side, which many people favor, but, uh, but a one-state solution of, uh, of Jews and, uh, and Arabs, uh, which uh, depending upon the birth rate, uh, could, uh, could cease to have a Jewish identity. So uh, it seems- Or to would me even from the get-go not, not be defined as a Jewish state, but just yeah. a, a Jewish Arab state, whatever. Uh, right, and there are many there are many people in Europe and in the U.S. Uh, who uh, who advocate this. Of course, they are not they are not there. Uh, it's uh, it, it's easy to advocate for things uh, from across an ocean that uh, that don't necessarily affect you directly. But the question I want to throw back to you. Uh, given these ideological agendas of both uh, responding to the one staters in the U.S. and Europe, and um, and trying to cement the right wing um, parliamentary majority in Israel, do you think that the that the Druze that the affront to the Druze was basically collateral damage? Yes, I do. <laughs> I, I don't think at all that the Hok Haleom. However, you want to translate it, uh, nationality law, nation state was designed in any way to harm anyone's feelings, uh, especially the Druze, because the, the state of Israel, as I mentioned, has prided itself on its good relations with the Druze community. And as I uh, also mentioned, there is a, a Druze member of the parliament, the Knesset, who actually supported the nation state law as is. Uh, so there was no intent uh, to, to be an affront to the Druze, but it, I think the language, I agree with Naftali Bennett, should have been thought out a little bit better, stated a little bit uh, um, more clearly that wh while this is a Jewish state, it is absolutely um, an egalitarian state for everybody. Thank you. Uh, so in that, uh, in that Jewish state, um, uh, not related to the documentary per se, but, uh, but Joan uh, Flewling, uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, wants to know if you're going to be leading any tours to Israel. Uh, when COVID ends, I would, I would love to. All I need is a minion. Get me, get me 10 people. Uh, you, you recruit 10 people for me and I'll take you. We'd love to do that. But, but uh, aside from that, I, I do have plans to go back uh, myself to produce another documentary, which I want to mention again before we close. Okay, um, uh, on the subject of tours to, to Israel, uh, there are many subsidized tours from different organizations and um, uh, Jewish people in general may be familiar with Birthright, which, uh, which welcomes Jews um, between the ages of um, 18 and uh, 27 or 30. Uh, it's not religious indoctrination, it's primarily informational uh, and um, uh, awareness building. Uh, there is also something called Honeymoon Israel uh, for couples up to 40. Uh, it's, a, it's a subsidized trip. The um, birthright Israel is basically free you just need some pocket money, it may be registration fee. Honeymoon Israel is not free, but it's very economical uh, and, uh, and subsidized, heavily subsidized. And, uh, and the couples do not have to be uh, both Jewish. There are many interfaith couples uh, take it and it's also not religious indoctrination. And there are many, many Christian uh, tours to uh, to Israel. There happens to be um, a Christian Zionist organization called Bridges for Peace, uh, whose um, international headquarters is in Jerusalem, but its U.S. headquarters is uh, about one hour from where Dr. Hansen is sitting right now, and about ten minutes from my house. Uh, and uh, and they run many tours uh, and. 
uh, one of their uh, executives, uh, Pastor Randy Alonzo, of um, founder of Central Life Church here in Brevard County, uh, was leading as many as five Christian trips a year to Israel before COVID. So uh, I, I hope as uh, as many uh, as many do that uh, travel will open up soon. Um, I see another question from uh, from uh, Alice Sterling. What about subsidized tours for American Druze? I don't know how many American Druze there are, Dr. Hansen. Uh, I, I'm not really aware of a Druze community <laughs> here in the United States. There, there are about 600,000 in Syria, 200,000 in Lebanon. Israel has about 150,000 uh, Jews with 20,000 of those living in the Golan Heights. The, really, their, their population centers are in the Middle East, having fanned out long ago in the 11th century from Cairo, where it started. So what language do the Israeli Jews speak among themselves? Arabic. Um, uh, although, uh, like most Israeli Arabs, they speak Hebrew fluently. Um, so uh, I, I've studied a little Arabic, not, not good enough to converse. So I spoke with them in, in Hebrew, no problem at all. Um, I, I was specifically looking for English speaking uh, Druze so that I could interview them, uh, but uh, communication was, was not a problem. They, they speak uh, very good Hebrew with a, a bit of an Arab, Arabic accent, which is also common. Um, it's interesting, most Israelis do not speak Arabic, do not, but most Israeli Arabs, and there's a large Arab population in Israel, do speak Hebrew. And so you answered, you answered, sort of answered my next question, which was going to be, do Jewish Israelis notice a difference uh, in, uh, in accent uh, when speaking with, uh, with Druze in person or on the phone? Yeah, you, you, you hear the accent, as with any Arab speaker, but perfectly um, understandable. Uh, Alice Sterling says that uh, she believes there are 45,000 Druze in the U.S., uh, I don't know where that figure comes from. We can, uh, we can look it up. Um, but I wanted to ask, how do the Druze in Israel relate to other Druze in Syria and Lebanon? Uh, one of your speakers mentioned his alienation from his brothers in Syria. Uh, how typical is this? And are there ever cross-border marriages? Uh, well, when you can't even see your family member on the other side of the border, like the gentleman I interviewed, couldn't, couldn't even see his brothers. Uh, finally, he met one brother in, in Jordan. So that pretty much rules out marriages. Uh, families are split up and the borders are very tight over there. And we talk about border walls over here in the United States. My goodness, uh, it's, it's fences and barbed wire and uh, it, it, a very, very tight uh, border. Uh, between Israel and its neighbors. Uh, so that has complicated the situation. It has split up families and there's a lot of bitterness over it. Um, now, you had one Druze speaker who called himself secular, uh, saying that Druze only marry other Druze. Uh, do Israeli Druze ever date other Israelis? I'm either not, I'm Jewish not aware or Muslim? Of them. I, I'm sure it might happen kind of uh, under the radar. Uh, but it would be considered really a breach of decorum uh, because the Druze are to stay among themselves. I couldn't, okay. I couldn't find anyone who, to, to admit to that. <laughs> but how about just uh, social relationships? Do uh, Jewish Israelis and Druze Israelis who serve together in the military ever maintain relationships after their service? Absolutely. And General Assad is a prime example. Uh, well respected in Israel, a public figure in Israel, uh, not to mention the Druze uh, Knesset member in the Israeli parliament, uh, who of, of course has many friends and associates uh, in, in the political spectrum and, and certainly in, in social life. So, uh, and, and then of course you had the Israeli whom I interviewed who was originally from Haifa and he moved to Daliat al Carmel, the Druze village, because he loves the Druze so much and their warmth and their openness and just moved his family there and decided to live among the Druze. So of, of course there's, there's a fine social interaction and something that the Israelis are, are proud of. It is a diverse society by anyone's estimation. 
And do the Druze, who are Israeli citizens, uh, and also the ones in Golan who are uh, legal residents, uh, do they partake of Israel's many higher education opportunities? Absolutely, such as the doctor I interviewed in the Golan Heights, who, who had studied in Israel and now, now practicing uh, in Israel. So absolutely, uh, all, the, all the benefits and educational opportunities of the state of Israel are available to them, although they, those individuals do not serve in the Israeli army. Uh, they're, they're not full citizens, they're considered uh, permanent residents. So you get the benefits, but you don't serve. <laughs> So it's, it's a good deal. It's a, it's a good deal. Uh, he wasn't uh, happy of, about it, but it's a good deal. Yeah. All of the Druze whom you interviewed on camera are men. Uh, were you prevented from interviewing uh, uh, adult Druze women? And not specifically, but in Druze society, it's interesting because the, the women are very egalitarian. They have, they have privileges that are absolutely equal, if not more so, than the men, because the women are preferred to be in the inner religious circle of the Druze. Yet, by the same token, a Druze, traditional Druze society is very rigid, and it is considered a breach of decorum for a man to be just speaking to a woman. And consequently, uh, there weren't any women who really wanted to do a one-on-one -on -one interview with me. Now you saw the one woman standing there who was a traditional woman standing next to the secular man, but she, she, of course she was in his company and she didn't say anything. Uh, so that was the one part of the documentary that was a little bit frustrating for me because I would love to have interviewed some women, but the, the, the Druze women just didn't want to be on camera. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, um, for the, the header of our program, the flyer that went out, uh, there, there's a photo that I actually took and it ended up on our flyer and it shows a street in the Druze village and there are two Druze women there in the traditional head garb and so on. Uh, I had a difficult time just taking that photo. I had to sneak around with my iPhone just to, to photograph a couple of Druze women because they don't want to even be seen. Certainly mm. not photographed. Now, um, another student of ours, Penny McCutcheon, asks if the Druze... Uh, are highly are as highly educated as the Jewish Israelis. You mentioned a, a specific example. In general, uh, are the Druze as well educated? Ah, uh, that's an excellent question. Hi, Penny. Uh, in theory, absolutely, but on a practical level, there is talk that that the opportunity are not there as much because on a socioeconomic level, they're not as many of the Druze villages are just not as well off. Uh, so there's debate about that. Uh, just as certain communities in the United States are not as well off and then we wonder if their educational level is comparable. And so a similar debate takes place in Israel, though, though in theory, absolutely all of the um, educational opportunities are open and some, as, as the gentleman I offered, became a doctor, some do take advantage, many take advantage of it. Uh, but but is, is the equity there in terms of, of socioeconomic level? That, that's another issue. Time to put in a quick plug for UCF, uh, which has a first generation scholarship program uh, for people who are the first in their family to have attended college. Uh, fully 25% of UCF's graduates since its inception have been the first in their family uh, to attend college. And, uh, and many of them have been able to access uh, UCF um, as a second stage by taking uh, the first two years of college at one of six um, uh, former community colleges that are now called state colleges uh, that uh, give them uh, direct access uh, to UCF, Valencia, Seminole State, Eastern Florida State, and so forth. Uh, so uh, UCF uh, and, uh, and its uh, donors to UCF funds seem to be doing their job uh, to, uh, to address some of the uh, inequities in this country. And I might add that the state of Florida um, matches donations to UCF's uh, first generation scholarship fund dollar for dollar. Um, 
we have another question now from uh, a student of ours, Angel Baez. Uh, if the Druze consist of a mixed multitude, uh, why do they uh, make it that no outsider can convert to their Druze religion if they are already mixed? I'm not sure I understand well, the word mixed multitude. You said in the documentary that, uh, that, there, that there is some uh, ethnic diversity among, uh, I among see. the Druze. Yeah, uh, a, a Persian, Turkish, uh, a Kurdish, Crusader. Um, my barber, you could see by his, his lighter complexion, he, he, he had Crusader stock in him. Um, a, a nice fellow. He, he only spoke Hebrew, by the way, but I, we made friends. Um, uh, but um, yeah, long ago, it was determined that there would be no uh, interbreeding, no proselytism, that, that this would be a sect unto themselves, uh, probably because they had experienced such persecution. Okay, and there's... I, I did, I, I think we're running out of time. Yeah, but there's one other question that I want to ask you to, to close with. Um, only one Jewish Israeli was interviewed in the documentary. What do Jewish Israelis in general think about the Druze? Again, very proud of the interrelationships that they have cultivated this Brit Damim. That's a Hebrew term understood by every Israeli. This is a covenant of blood. And, and Israelis appreciate this very much. They are very, very proud of their diversity. Now, uh, uh, one brief plug about the future. Uh, I'm so encouraged with how this turned out. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I have a, a thought for a second documentary percolating. And in fact, uh, just yesterday, I was working on the script for documentary number two. Uh, the COVID situation in Israel is improving markedly. It is still shut down currently, but it will be opening. I hope by the end of this year, I would love to get over there, even do a preliminary trip. The topic is going to be the Ethiopian Jews who were airlifted out of, literally, out of Africa and brought to the Jewish state back in the 1980s. It was the largest humanitarian airlift in history. And now there is an entire Ethiopian Jewish population living in the state of Israel. The story of the airlift itself is absolutely stirring. And let me tell you, it's a tearjerker. I've been going over the script myself, just practicing it, and I can, I can hardly keep a dry eye as I'm practicing my own script. It is so moving. And I want to get over there and find uh, members of the Ethiopian community who are now generations. They've grown up in Israel. Uh, one, of them is a, one of them I watch every day is a TV newscaster. I want to interview them, talk to them, flesh out this whole story, and I think it would be an incredible second documentary if we could if we could get a little chutzpah and maybe just a modicum of funding. Wouldn't that be great? Yes, it would. Uh, and that airlift, the story of that airlift also brought tears to my eyes when I first read about it as. Um, uh, years years ago, and the term that some of the uh, Ethiopians used because they hadn't seen an airplane before. Uh, the, the term they used in Hebrew was Nesher Barzel, right. Iron Eagle. Iron Eagle, yep. Nesher um, Barzel. Amazing, amazing. Um, Dr. Hanson, we'd like to thank everyone uh, viewing tonight's event and a special thank you to the UCF Department of History, College of Arts and Humanities and the donors that made this project possible. Um, people who, uh, who rewatch the documentary um, from the regular uh, YouTube link will see that there are some man on the street interviews of Jewish Israelis that come up afterwards, but only men, no Jewish Israeli women in the interviews I saw for whatever reason. Um, for those viewing tonight that would like to support future projects like this, uh, please go to the link that um, that Azela Santana has, uh, has typed in the chat, um, yes. uh, www.ucffoundation.org slash give now uh, to uh, give to CAH, College of Arts and Humanities, and select Judaic Studies General uh, to make a gift. Uh, your support allows Dr. Hansen and other faculty and students in this program uh, to continue 
their research of the ancient world and use cinematic productions and interactive video games to bridge the gap between past and present. Um, the, link will, the link is there in the chat, uh, as well as Dr. Hansen's new app. Um, and we have two more uh, quick questions um, uh, from Shmuel Kilstein. Do you need a production assistant on the next documentary? Thank you, Shmuel. Yes, you're hired. You got it. And from, uh, and from Melinda Kramer, uh, take a woman with you to help with the interviews. Please, can you fund yourself? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it's all on fund, a matter of funding, but that's what we need. But absolutely, yes, we would, we would love to have you aboard. So thank you again uh, to everyone in the audience for joining this evening's uh, production, presentation, and discussion. Have a good night. Laila Tov, Erev Tov. Laila Tov. Good night.